could Angela Meldrum come up and give us a wee insight into Amazons of Faith? So, hi there, everybody. I'm Angela Meldrum, and I'm a survivor. Yay. Um, just a few clinical points, just to start with. Um, I got diagnosed in January with breast cancer. Um, I've had a mastectomy and an auxiliary node clearance and then went on to chemotherapy, radiotherapy and I finished my treatment on the 8th of August. So I'm very new to all this. Um, I think that everyone would agree with me that cancer changes lives. So I want to give you a bit of an insight into what that has meant for me. Um, the breast cancer nurse at the hospital, um, I actually said so, um, our support group runs from the Queen Margaret in um, Dunfermline. So my breast cancer nurse had suggested that I go along to a support group if I wanted. And I thought, I'm an unsocial person. Do I really want to go to that? And I thought, well, I better go. I better go. Give it a, give it a try. But I have to say, I did arrange with my husband to come early so I had the excuse to leave. And uh, so anyway, I went along to it and I met a formidable group of ladies, some of who are here today, and you probably know them. <laughs> and um, I got introduced initially to uh, Carol Smith and to Tashina, who are both here. And um, Carol said to me, she says, don't, um, don't worry about, you'll never know, know everybody's names in the first meeting. She says, just make sure you remember mine. <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, by the end of that meeting, they had already got me signed up to do the relay in September, the Relay for Life. So that was it. I was, I was just hooked, basically. Right, next up is the North Island Cancer Information and Support Centre, and we've got Jennifer Ironside. Jennifer? At the Cancer Support Centre in Thurso, in the last few months, we've started a health choir. Um, this was started by someone who I know for a fact cannot sing a note because it was me. <laughs> and it, health choirs are not necessarily for just for people that can sing. They're, they're group activities, they're for everyone, and they're for promoting health and well-being. And I think it's, it's becoming recognised that they really do help people. They, release endorphins that make us feel good and, and, and they're excellent. So, um, a chance meeting with a local who is a professional musician and conductor and she has um, a social enterprise business called caithnessmusic.com and their remit is to promote health and well-being uh, in the community through group making music making. So that seemed to be quite a good idea for us to join forces with them because our remit is to promote health and well-being in various strands of our service. So we got together and there's about 16, approximately 16 of our members get together fairly regularly and we have this choir. We've not made a CD, nobody's invited us to the Royal Albert Hall yet. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but it, it's excellent, and people are really getting a lot out of it. They're, they're thoroughly enjoying it. Morning, everybody. Uh, so my name's Jack. Uh, I've been working for Macmillan for nearly four years now, and there's um, a million things I'd love to talk to you about this morning, but I'm going to talk in less than three minutes about this, this small part of what's been my work and many other people's. But um, just before, I, I will forget to say it at the end, so I'll say it at the beginning, that Alan Gow and Fiona White and Heather Woods and your... your uh, colleagues in this area are absolutely fantastic so please do go to them and ask them more about all the work we do around learning and development and all the other support we give to support groups that, that's what our role is and it's, it's fantastic I just want to focus in on just one thing that I've been doing and I really just wanted to ask a question in these in these three minutes I have which essentially is does this sound interesting if the answer is yes let us know um, Building research partnerships comes from the ethos, basically, that, that research is for everyone. We're all here today because of research. And because it's for everyone, everyone can be involved in it. We've, we've been told throughout the conference how important involvement is. Research, though, people don't often even know they can get involved, or if they do, it might not be obvious how. So I think charities and the government should actually be leading the way in sharing free resources, telling people how they can get involved in research which is exactly what this is. So 
We've been partnering with the National Institute for Health Research for over 10 years now, and recently we adapted this resource into a shared learning resource for professional researchers and professionals and members of the public. And they all come together in the same room and they all talk about how they're going to get involved in research. Um, and actually, we've also made it relevant to all conditions, not just cancer. So it's a way of actually broadening it and saying that if you want to get involved, actually there's a lot of commonalities amongst other conditions and we can all learn from each other. So um, just to talk a bit, in case I've, I've gone a bit too far too soon, when I talk about getting involved in research, most people will immediately think, oh, well, they want me to be a participant on a clinical trial and try out drugs on me. That's not at all what it is. That's being a participant on a trial. Being involved in research is any stage of the cycle. So the government will fund research with our money, with our taxpayers' money. So we should all have a say in what's researched. You know, what are the research priorities? How should that be done? What are, what are the ethics? You can be involved in the ethics. Right through to the dissemination. I was speaking to someone yesterday, who I'm hoping is in the room, um, who said, well, I'm doing research into massage and the effectiveness of massage as a complementary therapy. But actually, you can all be involved in disseminating that kind of research, you know, getting involved and making sure that the commissioners or local people, I'm getting a nod, I've just, just seen, seen Anne. So yeah, um, I promised I'd talk for less than three minutes, and I've probably already <laughs> broken that promise. That was three minutes, Joe. Ah, in that case, I've got another 10. Um, OK, so the ask or the offer to you guys is in um, what we've been doing in Northern Ireland, what we've done in Wales, is we've trained local facilitators to actually run the course. So local people affected by cancer are trained to run the course. And local organisations support the running of it. And basically the question to you is, if, this, if you think you might be interested in getting involved in research, if you think you'd like to learn more, um, contact either myself, Alan, Heather Woods, Fiona, or there's a big orange button there. And the, U the, the web address isn't that one up there, but it's just macmillan.org.uk forward slash research learning. So hopefully that is interesting. And basically, anyone who'd like to work with us or thinks this is interesting, please get in touch. And we're hoping down the line to also do a bit of work into patient experience and the variation in patient experience and, and trying to understand why that varies. So actually, you could all potentially be involved in a lot of fascinating research which could help people for generations to come. So I'll say no more other than thank you for listening and uh, do come talk to me if you have any more questions. Thank you. In a nutshell, what we're trying to do is make sure that throughout Scotland, anyone living with cancer who would like massage therapy is able to get access to it and get a massage that's appropriate to their needs. So if I just move on to talking about the research, we're very excited because we've just published our first piece of research on our website. And what we did is we focused on looking at research that's already been done into the benefits of massage and cancer. We've pulled together substantial pieces of work and drawn out the key findings that we think are relevant to our different audiences. So we're particularly aiming our findings at general members of the public, anybody who's interested in massage, the therapists themselves, and people obviously living with cancer as well. So what did we actually find? Well, first of all, I'm happy to say that we found that a lot of research has been done, both in the UK and throughout Europe and America, into the benefits of massage for people living with cancer. The studies are across a wide range. Some of them focus on particular cancer types. So, for example, there's been a lot of work done by people um, interested in the relationship between breast cancer and massage and how those two um, are linked and how the, how the benefits of massage transfer onto that particular type of cancer. Um, but a lot of the studies also looked across a range of cancer types and found benefits across different types of cancers through the treatment. Um, so this gives us a degree of confidence that we can see with the correct training, anybody who is uh, involved in cancer treatment or has had cancer in the past can safely have a massage. Hello, good morning everyone. <laughs> My name's Rob Lester and I'm very pleased to be with you all today. I was diagnosed with cancer last February and it's prostate cancer. And uh, I wasn't expecting that. Uh, I was working, everything was going quite smoothly, and then all of a sudden I started to have problems going to the toilet. And going to the toilet is quite an embarrassing problem, and uh, something that 
we just uh, don't like. But it didn't seem too bad. So I went along to see my GP and got a blood test. Oops, it was a bit high. So I had to go in Fife and get tested, get sorted, and I'm now getting seen at the Western General Hospital in Edinburgh and everything is going really well. I belong to the Edinburgh and Lothian Prostate Cancer Support Group and I found that group on the internet through Prostate Cancer UK, Prostate Scotland and Macmillan. All these websites lead you to prostate support groups, which I found really helpful. Our support group does one or two things. We do buddying, and buddying is extremely useful in a one-to-one. -one. We also do meetings, which happen every month. And then we do a website, and the website is run by one of our members, and it's very good for giving information that's recent. But then we have ideas, and one of the ideas was to do a toilet card. Now, I'm with Les, who many of you will have met, and Les is going to just hand round at each row, and I ask you just to pass it on and have a quick look. That's our toilet card. All right. Now, if anybody can see it, it shows somebody sitting on the toilet. <laughs> which is quite important when you want to make the point quickly. <laughs> I've used it. We were in uh, Edinburgh Waverley up at Costa, and if anybody you know Edinburgh Waverley at Costa, there are no toilets. So I had a dreadful urgency problem, and I had to rush at full speed downstairs to the downstairs toilets, and of course, you need 20p. And I didn't have 20p <laughs> in my pocket. So I pulled out the card, showed it to the guy in the door, and instantly I got in. What, what a relief. <laughs> <laughs> We've had great feedback on this card. A lot of our members find it really useful. It's a very small example of something that a support group can actually do that makes a difference. Is it expensive? No, it's not. We managed to get 500 of these put out for 200 pounds. Now, 200 pounds is really very little. And from our point of view, it's been a great investment. So if any support groups are thinking of doing things that actually help their members in a very practical way, I would look at the symptoms that you have and think, you know, what's the most distressing thing that you have? In our case, it's obviously toileting. Make the point and people want to help. They do. They do really want to help. And rather than block your way to the toilet and see you jump up and down, <laughs> they'll let you in. I'm going to try my best, but bear with me. Um, I'm going to say 90% of my speech is a load of rubbish. But to start with, I've got to thank Lorraine, who's my wife, and Joe, who's the treasurer. And I've raised a lot of money this year for our uh, charity. We are only a wee small group of under 12 people. But it doesn't matter what size your group is. We've all got the same aim. So thank you very much. Right, I'm going on a life in general. I was going to talk about before I'd my up. I was just a poor old working man who worked all day and slept all night. <laughs> but uh, since I got my hope, he, the things you take for granted is unbelievable. I can't pee and talk at the same time now. <laughs> so, when, when, I'm, when I'm standing at the urinal, I'm going to uh, train and I'm saying, hope this boy doesn't talk to me. Thank you for inviting me here today. My name is Susie Dingle. I'm, I'm uh, a musician. I'm a professional musician and I live in Caithness. I've lived in Caithness for about the last year. And I'm uh, part of uh, an organisation called, called caithnessmusic.com and we do a lot of community music making and teaching 
working with children and adults throughout the community in Caithness. And something I've been doing for the last, what, two and a half months now, maybe, around about that, is that I've been going into the uh, North Highland Cancer Support and Information Centre and I've been doing some choral sessions there. Singing for pleasure, that's all it is. It's not about singing to uh, prepare for a concert or anything like that. It's just about singing because singing is good for you. Singing for health, that's why I thought I'd tell you a little bit about singing for health and why it's good for you. There you go, there's a list. It was actually in, was it Scotland on Sunday or the Herald or something last week? It's good for your aerobic capacity. It reduces muscle tension, it improves your posture, releases those wonderful endorphins. Your immune system is boosted. Sinuses and respiratory tubes opened up. Depression, anxiety and anger can all be alleviated. Singing is amazing. It's incredibly good for you. It's a real, really h holistic activity. In order to sing, you have to use your whole body. You have to breathe. And people tell me sometimes they can't sing. Nah, I don't believe that. If you can speak, you can sing, you can join in. Even if you can't sing in tune, it doesn't matter because the physical act of trying to sing is good for you. And the physical experience of being in a group of people who are making a noise together with one voice is very powerful. Brilliant. Brilliant. Singing is easy, you can all do it. I hope you've uh, enjoyed singing a few wee songs. Now, I know there's a bit of a tradition here that you finish with a certain song, and I believe Adeline normally leads it. Where are you? Please, this is your, this is your party. <laughs> Alan's got music there, so we And you know, we sing this every year. We're no want to bite them all. And then after we sing that, we'll sing our long sign. The first chorus of our long sign. This will be another year before we see each other. Before I start singing, Claire, you've done a wonderful job again. Committee, wonderful. Thank you all very much. For we're no want to bite them all. 